and then it recovers as the dust clears. It's generally only a, a one-time event, and then it stays uh, pretty much flat and slowly declines. I should point out that uh, for the graduate students and postdocs around, these outbursts take place on your time scale as opposed to the time scale of your uh, tenured professor. <laughs> Next. So they don't all look the same. Here are four other Nova Sig 1992. I'll come back to that and show you some of the uh, expanding nebula from our HST and, in fact, large binocular telescope observations. And then this is Nova Pool of 1990. This is the latest bright Nova. This is Nova Dell. Uh, we were having a Nova team workshop in uh, Minneapolis this summer, and we were commiserating with each other that there hadn't been a really bright Nova in years. And on the last day of the meeting, this was discovered. Got up to about fourth. Uh, we were, we'll try and remember those incantations for the next meeting. And it went into a decline. Uh, it turns out to be a carbon oxygen Nova. And on the next uh, transparency, uh, it's the fourth. It was detected by gamma rays. Uh, no sign of dust formation as of this weekend. Uh, and it's the first carbon oxygen nova to be seen as a super soft source. And that is at uh, low energy x rays with Swift. Uh, Kim Page in Leicester is the one who does all of this stuff. She's a remarkable good, good young woman. Go ahead. So here is the her light curve as of November 1st. So, you know, I'm not boring you with full data. None of this is published yet. Uh, obviously. So you can see, whoops, that's okay, leave it there, that's all right. Uh, okay, so here is the, the light curve. This is an actual real data point. Uh, and then it goes up, then it comes down. The next one shows uh, what it was doing this weekend. We took a look and it was bright and went dim again. Uh, and we predicted that every time we looked at it, it would be bright again. But then, of course, the next observation, it did the opposite. But I'm not going to show you that. Okay, next. Okay, let me switch to the you know subject of this meeting: asymmetrical planetary nebula ejection. This is RS Okuyuki. It's a white dwarf exploding inside the envelope of a close giant companion as a period of about 450 days. Uh, it's a symbiotic. Uh, in fact, symbiotic novae are. Uh, pretty, a lot of them are recurrent, so uh, if not, we just have to wait longer. So here it is on day 63. These are, sorry, day 14. These are uh, VLBI observations. You can see that there's some kind of uh, cap moving away by day 63. You can see this very interesting uh, uh, asymmetrical shape. Uh, it takes about 60 days for this expanding shock to move away from or penetrate the outer edge of the red giant. Can you do the next? Okay, and this actually is a radio observation taken for the 1985 outlook. So we've got you know ears there, onset we'll call them. Okay, so here our radio VLBA on day 13, VLBA on day 28. You can see this sort of jet or whatever blob moving away at very high speeds, uh, thousands of kilometers per second, different six centimeters, 18 centimeters, uh, and obviously asymmetric. And this says expanding ring. And here's our model. Uh, this is Tim O'Brien. Uh, did this work. There's also, I'm not going to show the HST, which show the shock and details of this material moving out. We saw Neon 5 moving at uh, high speed. So here's a line of sight from left to right coming in here. Bipolar shell, uh, another word you've heard a lot, inside of a giant wind. Here are some of their models. Uh, we now refer to this as the, the new Mac Pro model of the outburst. So here, we, you've seen this, I think it was uh, 
No one showed this. V1280 SCO, uh, deep dust forming carbon oxygen nova, clearly not spherical and uniformly filled. I will stop for a second. Uh, those of you who know, uh, chefs know, uh, I just learned this morning he's quite ill, and uh, you may want to you know, send your best wishes for his speedy recovery. But uh, sad. So here, some more pictures. These are uh, just different things. Okay, turning to uh, some Hubble images. Uh, you've already seen GK Per 1901. Uh, this is not that. I have a colorized image of work done by Tina Lehman at the Tartu Observatory. She is actually following the expansion of these blobs, doing a very nice piece of work. Some of the first parts are already been published. And I encourage you, if you're interested in GK Per, uh, to look at her stuff. And uh, from a Skype conversation right after somebody's talk this morning, she says, we don't know the mass of the big shell around GK Per, so uh, it's not necessarily one off. Okay, here's V1974 SIG. This is, the, is a picture taken uh, as part of the year early release observations uh, right after they fixed the uh, problem with uh, HSD. This is DQ Her, 1934. Uh, we've been taking images of it. Uh, you can barely see it, but there are these striations across the surface, which are not understood. Uh, the next picture shows, this is the pre-fixed uh, uh, image taken on day 464, and then the one I just showed you, showing how the expanding shell around 1974 SIG is evolving. These are not real, in some sense. We've taken the spectroscopy, the spectroscopic profiles, and used them to predict emissivities as a function of radius from the uh, star. And in fact, you can see that uh, it's not too bad, but you know, it's a good, good try. Okay, this was taken with HST Nikmos a few years later. Uh, the previous uh, image was less than an arc second. Now in 1998, uh, Joachim Crowder et al. Uh, this is the long axis diameter is about a second of arc. And uh, last week, with a large binocular telescope, this is the MODS uh, detector. This is a spectrogram, spectrogram. And there it is. And it's about five seconds of arc. Uh, we're supposed to be getting a Lucifer spec infrared spectrum, but we haven't got it yet. OK, you've seen uh, images of V445 pop. It ejected only, oh my, uh, sorry, that was early this morning. It's uh, carbon and helium. It may be a 1A progenitor because 1As, as you all know, uh, show me your hydrogen or helium in their spectrum at any time. Uh, cross off the H there, and then I'll show you. And some people think their 1As are useful in cosmology, but they're neat things. Anyway, so here is a spectrum that Mark Wagner and I got in 2001 at the Multiple Mirror Telescope. And if you look closely, you will find no sign of hydrogen in that spectrum. Uh, there's some helium-1, but it's really cool, and uh, some interesting things, O1 and stuff like that. Now, of course, the important point is on this uh, picture, uh, taken by Patrick Luke and his collaborators, over a period of time, 2005 through more recent with AO, no hydrogen ever detected in the ejected gases. The Secondary is very luminous, okay, about uh, log L over L sun, about 100. That's not the normal companion. Uh, and it looks like it's a hydrogen deficient carbon star transferring helium and carbon onto the white dwarf. Uh, I have done some calculations of what happens during that accretion phase, and I get 1A explosions. I don't get no. So there's something like, oh, by the way, the other point, if you, uh, I won't go back to the other spectrum, but the lines are very sharp 
from just fitting full width half maximum to those lines, we get uh, expansion velocities of a few hundred kilometers per second, 600. If you use the AO imaging, you get perpendicular expansion velocities of thousands of kilometers per second. So this is certainly not a spherical, uniformly expanding shell. Okay. Uh, here's FH Serpentis, similar shape to DQ Her. This was another deep dust forming ANOVA. These are images taken uh, by Gill and O'Brien, published in the monthly notices some years ago. Again, we have these sort of horizontal striations uh, that we don't spend maybe some others five seconds of our. Uh, here is, you can't read, this is a different NOVA, this is V533 Her. Again, sort of has polar jets or something. Uh, here's their spectra. Again, this is Gill and O'Brien uh, of how they re uh, reconstituted the uh, image that uh, you saw. This is their attempts uh, to actually model those, uh, their, their images, their non spherical images. Novi and their rings and jets and stuff like that, whatever you want to call them. Okay, you can't see, I, I was afraid of this. Uh, this is from a paper that uh, Steve and I published in 2013. No, Mon 2012, it was actually discovered in gamma rays before we realized it was a Nova. And uh, this is a model spectral profile. When we have real spectra, I promise you. But this is a model spectral profile. We take the images, uh, sorry, we take this, and we predict the emissivities as a function of distances. This is in kilometers per second. And we get this. It doesn't look at all uniform. OK, now, why did I throw this in? What does it have to do with this? Well, it gives me an opportunity to give a quick and dirty summary of what actually affects the properties of no outburst. Okay, so what is it? NMRD is peak magnitude uh, versus the rate of decline. You saw the way they could go down. Well, okay. Uh, an important parameter is the viewing angle. So the paper that's most quoted is Delavalli and uh, Mario Livio in 1995, where they took a lot of M31 and LMC Novi that had been published and you can see that, you know, here's sort of the, it, oh, you can't read it. It's, it's a plot log of the rate of decline versus maximum magnitude. We actually have to go to the LMC or M31 or M82 because distances of Novi in the plane of the galaxy are really poorly unknown. It's very hard to determine the reddening, and you need to get that in the super soft X-ray source with Chandra, because Chandra has the long wavelength tail, we can actually fit that tail with atmospheres and get N sub H. Oh, okay, that's all right. Never mind. All, all I was going to do was make a joke about that, because you see this very complicated line that uh, Mario fit to the data, and then people use it as a godsend. You know, we now can fit the NMRD, and we've got a distance to an OVA. And all I want you to do is realize that you see that in the paper, ignore the paper. It's wrong. So here's the, their fit. And Nancy Castlewall, working with Shri Sikharni with the Palomar Transient Factory, uh, looked you know, much deeper, much not about the same amount of time, M31 and M82. Uh, they're both on this plot. And they published a paper saying, oh, we've you know, thrown away the MMRD because we found these faint, fast NOVI, which makes theorists uh, very unhappy. And unfortunately, I was the referee. I did sign it, so I can say it. And I told them that the theorists don't believe in the MMRD. Anyway, so you can see that for a given time scale, given rate of decline, there's rather a broad uh, variation in absolute magnitude. Don't use it to get instances to NOVI. OK, so. What does the peak luminosity and rate of decline depend? Depends on the whiteboard mass. 
higher the white dwarf mass, the smaller amount of accreted material. Amount of accreted material, how fast is it ejected? How fast does it go optically thin? Is what it definitely affects the rate of applying white dwarf luminosity. The more luminous the white dwarf. Okay, there's an evolutionary statement. When was the last outburst? Has it had time to cool? We took the 1974 SIG, four years after the outburst, measured the conditions of the underlying object with HST. It fell in a region of the HR diagram that no other object falls in. So they're doing something strange. Okay, so less mass is accreted. Rate of mass accretion. Higher the rate of mass accretion, the more easily you get to thermonuclear conditions. Composition. Carbon-12 was the most reactive of the carbon, nitrogen, oxygen elements. And oxygen neon nova has almost no carbon, so it can accrete more material and be more violent. If you add more carbon, say from a previous outburst, or you mix up more, the outburst occurs earlier. If we can get rid of all the carbon, outburst takes a long time. And then the viewing angle. Okay, following a polon explosion will get different 